Good afternoon, everybody. Great to have you join us. Uh, Friday afternoon, always a good uh, a good time to have a little kind of uh, look after yourself, um, train yourself, show up in the source session. Um, so we're good. today we're going to do a taster session on our course called P3 Assurance for the PMO Professional. Now, as um, all of our courses are, uh, we are, as a PMO specialist, we make sure that the courses that we deliver definitely give you the uh, PMO perspective, uh, not just a general project management perspective. So this is a, a two-day course that we deliver um, at PMO Learning, and I'm just going to take you through a little bit of, of an idea of what's in the schedule, give you an example of one of the sessions so you've got a better feel for exactly what you're going to get from the course and whether it's the right course for you. Just a, a quick pointer, um, if you're um, in Zoom, feel free to open your chat box. Um, we've got uh, myself and other people are there uh, looking after the chat. So any questions, any comments, feel free to put them in. Um, People will be talking over the lunch as we recognise. So if you'd want to kind of speak out loud with your mouth full, just kind of type that in. But we are open as well to everybody to put the cameras on. Um, good to see some people with their cameras on. But also as well, if you want to join in, just kind of uh, unmute yourself or kind of make yourself known or kind of put your hand up. Uh, use all of the functionality of Zoom and we'll kind of we'll get the questions sorted as we go. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Eileen Roden. I'm one of the uh, directors at hear more learning. Um, I'm going to gloss over that because that's not the important bit. The important bit is in terms of who we get to deliver this course. So here at PMO Learning, what we do is we try to, uh, well, we always do, we provide trainers who've got real life experience of the subject area and have real life experience working in a PMO. So this is the gentleman who delivers this course for us. Is a guy called Roy Millard. He's been um, lead uh, risk a uh, person at both Crossrail and Transport for London. He's led uh, the PM, the APM SIG for risk, uh, for assurance for uh, 12 years. So well experienced in developing, tailoring, designing assurance activities for lots of different size organisations, huge, uh, big projects as well. So it was very clear that he can... Um, tailor it but also have some real life conversations you know we're all used to going on some training courses where we get kind of fed theory and it all sounds really great but we kind of look at our own organizations and think do you know I'm not sure any of that would work in practice as to where I am well Roy's had real experience of tailoring well writing some of that best practice but also tailoring it to the size of project the type of organization the industry uh, sector that we're working so he's there actually delivers the course and all I'm here doing is giving you kind of the two-day taster. For those of you who've not actually um, uh, met PMO Learning before, we are a, a specialist training provider. Uh, we only deliver courses that are relevant to PMO people, and that's definitely our target audience. We recognise we get some other people, uh, some friends of PMO, so we do get some project programme portfolio managers who work in and around PMO. They're always welcome as well. But our focus, as ever, is to deliver, um, as we've got there, highly interactive courses, giving um, PMO people an understanding of project management, program management, portfolio theories, and understanding how we can implement and support them through the services we provide um, in our PMO. Um, all of our trainers, myself uh, and uh, Roy, um, as, as well as everybody else who delivers for us has had real experience of working in a PMO and actually a number of our trainers actually still have a day-to-day -day job actually working in a PMO so they um, have a, a, arrangements with their organisations to deliver training for a number of days a month for us. So again we were had one of our trainers deliver a course last week and actually they were talking about service catalogues and the trainer said well I can show you what I use in my organisation so again that ability to have some kind of real life conversations not somebody who's just uh, learned the textbook. So today's session, uh, which is probably going to be about 45 minutes or so, is to give you an understanding about um, the P3 assurance course, but also in terms of understanding how we deliver this in a virtual environment. Now, um, I know I've said this and I do it on every course, but I still think it's important because not everybody has really um, had some um, 
necessarily a good experience or any experience of actually training in a virtual classroom and there is a real difference between a virtual classroom and something like kind of e-learning or kind of what we call online learning where you sit and watch a video on YouTube. Um, often um, we've had a couple of people kind of uh, turn up um, at the at, at an event think it's going to be a webinar yes where essentially it's a bit like a lecture where they sit and listen so it's almost a kind of a, a passive activity they sit in the background and kind of listen to bits perhaps take a few notes if they want to but but not at all uh, really interactive they may get the opportunity uh, like we do today to kind of ask questions and even a, a level of interaction however when we're talking about a virtual classroom we're talking about something quite different we're talking talking about um, as if you're in a real classroom. So if you're in a real classroom, you're sitting around a desk together, you've got workbooks that you work through, you've got some slides that you go through. There's ongoing conversation with the trainer all the way through the course. You have little conversations in groups of two or three. You do exercises either in a group or you kind of go and play on some flip charts. And when we deliver virtual training, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to replicate as much as possible what we do in that virtual classroom and people who kind of do it for the first time are always kind of quite surprised how effective that is but also in terms of how much how connected they feel to the trainer and to the other delegates on the course so that's what we're um we're trying to uh, establish but we do have some um some kind of house rules uh, that we use as well to ensure that kind of people uh, get the best out of that and contribute to that virtual classroom environment that we're looking for so we do ask um for people to put their camera on um, when we're doing a training course in the same way as you would run the classroom, you kind of be physically there in the space with them. We recognise uh, everybody does and uh, very occasionally my dogs go a bit mad or the front doorbell rings and all of that kind of things. We recognise people are at home, but on the whole, we like people to keep their cameras on just because we uh, as humans make better connections uh, with people. Uh, we do recognise that people are on their laptops or PCs um, and therefore there is a tendency um, for people to kind of leave their outlook open, their chat boxes open, their WhatsApp uh, notifications. And we do ask people to kind of try as much as possible to uh, reduce that so they can actually kind of focus on the course in the same way in a classroom. We wouldn't necessarily want you kind of on your phone um, answering messages in the same way we'd like you to be focused uh, when you're actually on the courses. We do put enough breaks in during the day to give you a chance to catch up on all your social media and emails. Um, it is very much a passive, uh, sorry, uh, um, interactive course. We uh, we need all of the delegates to uh, get involved in the conversations, get involved in the exercises, and and it is the delegates course. So it really is important that you ask and make use of having the trainer there in front of you to ask any questions that you feel are are relevant, and particularly on the certification courses to make sure that you're fully aware of kind of what you need to understand in order to pass uh, the exam. We do recognise that there are um, occasionally some kind of um, technical delays, uh, just because that's the way Zoom works. It prefers it if only one person is speaking at a time. So we do use some of the uh, technology around um, 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 reactions, um, etc. I also can kind of raise your hand to the screen is also a good chance of getting your um trainer's attention but again using chat and um, we ask people to kind of if you've got kind of a pneumatic drill going outside your door or the kind of the dog barking to mute yourself but otherwise we let people kind of manage their own mute buttons so they can kind of join in and step back and it's really interesting as a trainer if everybody mutes all the time you've got deathly silence and actually in a classroom you never have deathly silence you know you have people kind of kind of cups on the saucers and getting a bit slurp and a bit tea so actually I personally quite like it when everybody's kind of unmuted and we get a bit more of that kind of natural noise uh, in the meeting it's not kind of distracting um to the to the delivery and then finally and um, just kind of recognize again um we all kind of slightly more cocoon because we're typically sitting um at our own place uh, on our own and it's just to remember that the other delegates are there um, and making sure we give them the opportunity and, and ask them to contribute as we go through the course so we do have um some house rules that we ask the delegates to uh, take care of um, and contribute to as we go through technology wise uh, and this um 99% of the time uh, doesn't cause any issues. Uh, we use Zoom um, 
for uh, as we do for this uh, taste test session to do the kind of the standard kind of PowerPoint and audio chat breakout rooms and occasionally we use polls in there as well. Um, separate to that, we use uh, Metimeter, Miro and Trello. Uh, none of these technologies um, incur any cost to the delegate. They're all kind of you can get free access to those. Now, the one thing we do ask um, Jen sends out joining instructions a week before the course. We do ask you to log on and just check that you're going to have no problems with the technology before the course. We also have the first kind of 15, 20 minutes on the first day just to make sure that everybody has access. But if you do have problems, it's much easier to sort them out prior to the course than kind of taking up that time on the first day of the course. So the joining instructions will have all of the details uh, around that. And um, before you purchase the course, if you're worried about any of those technologies, if you get in touch with um, uh, Jen on course administrator at paymorelearning.com, sorry, course to admin at paymorelearning.co.uk, she'll take you through all of that uh, before that you kind of sign up for the course if you want to. Thanks, Jen, for putting that in there in the uh, in the chat there. So her email there is if you want to get in touch about that. But more importantly, let's have a look at the kind of the course structure and content. So um, just a, a kind of a, a quick link in terms of assurance, as for those of you who know the PMO competence framework and um, assurance is one of those competencies that is really important to the PMO uh, particularly if we're at program and portfolio level there is some involved at project level uh, sometimes it's done to us sometimes we're doing it but certainly a kind of program and portfolio level and in center of excellence where perhaps you're designing some of that um, assurance activity as well one of the reasons why we want the um wanted to have the course on our books. Um, so day one, um, look at that crowded agenda on day one, really looking at um, some of the kind of the, the detailed theory around um, assurance. So understanding kind of where it's there, what assurance is, the link and the interesting links between assurance, governance, risk uh, management, and looking at how project program and portfolio management uh, portfolio assurance links into corporate assurance. We'll introduce the three lanes model. So previously called the three lanes of defense, um, now called the three uh, lanes model. And then we kind of start looking at and starting to drill down into the PMO context and who does the, um, the auditing and the assurance. This concept of integrated assurance um, and how that kind of links together, again, project program portfolio, maintaining a level of objectivity, looking at what an assurance framework might be and what um, is there in best practice. When we move on to day two, really we're starting to go get into the kind of the bones of how that's actually applied. So we start looking at the different types of reviews and audits that are, are taking place, uh, what they look like, the comparison between a, a review and an audit. And then we look at and we have some uh, really good exercises that really will take us through for you to uh, understand how to put uh, a review together, how to kind of the, deliver the assurance, some tools and techniques to use, recognising some human factors. So definitely kind of the behavioural side of the people who are asking for the reviews, people who are undertaking the reviews, and as importantly, perhaps some of the um, some of the responses in terms of when we're undertaking those reviews. So again, looking at kind of how we manage that overall process and making sure sure we get some follow-up and uh, review closure. Um, some real kind of practical considerations, and this is where Roy's experience really kind of comes into his own um, in terms of kind of telling you about kind of the realities of delivering some of that. So what's not necessarily being kind of picked up during the course, some additional kind of things that he will help you uh, look out for. And again, answer any specific questions around your organisations about things that you can kind of take into consideration. And then some kind of seven secrets of successful project reviews. We keep you there right to the very end to get a hold of kind of Roy's kind of golden seven uh, secrets.
Now, for all of our courses, and I'll reiterate this uh, again, you can turn up and kind of do those two days. You've got enough there to kind of get some real kind of practical lessons in terms of what that means. Uh, take it back into your organisation and make a difference. However, what we always offer is a, a third day where Roy can kind of come into the organisation um, or work with you on a coaching uh, piece or actually kind of work with your team. And actually, he's actually got a detailed day three, which we'll do in-house uh, with you and your team where it's absolutely tailored to your organization so it doesn't kind of they're not necessarily the first two days are consecutive but if you come on the course think it's really great think actually we could really make a difference in our organization we can arrange a third day at a later date for Roy to come and kind of run through some of the key things and tailor it for your organization you don't um that's not included in the cost what we deliver is day one and two and then we'll kind of uh, the third day is an optional one uh, you can choose to do with your organization so that's a kind of a high level overview of the course. I thought what I would just do today was just to kind of pick up um, on uh, one element of this, which is kind of always a, a challenge uh, in terms of maintaining a level of um, objectivity around the course. Now, one of the um, things that's included in the materials is this integrated assurance uh, book, uh, which is available. It's an APM um publication that was um led by the de development which was developed by Roy we include that as a one of the kind of the texts um we add additional things in but there's some interesting bits in there that we use um on the course so the session I'm going to go through is I said day one session four so getting towards um the end of the day um three real challenges with um kind of putting together assurance and, and reviews for our organisation. These are the ones that we kind of see uh, very often. One is that in organisations, there are lots of different people who are interested in doing reviews um, and audits. So, you know, as well as kind of corporate audit, perhaps you've got a review by the IT department because they want to make sure that whatever systems that you're implementing is going to be kind of fit with the IT strategy. You've obviously got the kind of financial audit to make sure that the spending is going all in the correct way. If it's an engineering project as well, there may be other people who are involved in terms of making sure that the solution um, is right. You've got kind of standard project and program management audit to make sure that actually we've got um, we're, we're doing things in the in the right way. That's kind of going to give us our best chance of having a positive outcome. So this kind of trying to understand kind of who does what audit where. Um, recognizing that an audit, even though it might be done by people external to the um, project or program, it's actually going to take time by the people who are in the project and program. And if we've got too much time taken away, it really struggles to um, to kind of find time to actually do the real work. Um, and actually, there's a real challenge for the credibility of the people who are doing the actual kind of assurance themselves. And, and I know having been, a, been audited by a, one of the big five on a number of projects that I've been working on, they sometimes send in um, fresh faced graduates who you kind of think, well, actually, um, are on a tick box exercise just to kind of say they've kind of done something. Um, and so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to help our organisations that we work in pull together what we call integrated assurance, an overall picture of how this particular project sits within a program, sits within a portfolio, aligns with the corporate governance. And again, this is why we can, as, as I said, we kind of use as a reference book this integrated uh, assurance guide uh, from the APM. And they've got um, four key areas within that. Um, really kind of driving us to this kind of contribution of assurance act of this coordination not contribution the coordination of assurance activities to make sure that it's fit for purpose and um, one of the areas that i'm just going to kind of pull off uh, and have a quick conversation around uh, today and quite happy if you kind of want to ask any questions is just the five principles that underpin integrated assurance that as a PMO individual, it's really important that we recognise and understand how that fits with the assurance activities that we are planning for our organisation. 
So the first, uh, the first principle uh, that we look at is all about independence and making sure that the people who are undertaking that assurance activity don't have any skin in the game. It's always a really interesting one in terms of how can the PMO actually kind of do a, a assurance or do a review of a project or program where they are the PMO manager for that particular project or program. And again, this is where we start thinking, well, actually understanding our PMO structure in terms of where does the assurance come from, because we can't expect people in the um, individual uh, project or program offices to do um, all of the review. We do need a kind of a level outside of that in order to do them. So we talk about using kind of the centre of excellence and perhaps rules of the portfolio office on those projects and programmes. The second uh, principle which we delve into in a little bit more detail is to make sure we understand where accountability sits or who in the project or program has accountability to ensure that um, assurance is undertaken and assurance is all about um, confidence that the project or program is going to deliver and deliver the right outcomes and, and benefits so where does that accountability sit making sure we've got the right level of uh, contribution in the design execution of assurance that that accountability is upheld. I think the other thing, the other side of accountability uh, is, is making sure that um, that people are held accountable. So it's all well and good saying, so the sponsor is accountable for ensuring the project delivers, but actually who holds that uh, sponsor accountable. So making sure that kind of if anything comes out of that, it goes back as well to the sponsor or the accountable person. Third area is that any assurance activities need to be planned and coordinated. What we don't want to do is get through the project or program, have this fantastic project uh, plan, project schedule uh, uh, with a project management plan uh, wrapped around it to then suddenly decide, well, actually, we're going to have 27 different ac assurance activities that kind of blows that plan out of the water. So part of the whole kind of planning uh, process for the project has to be embed those assurance activities, which leads very much to the, the fourth principle, which is about proportionality. But if say that very carefully so proportionality so what we don't want to do is have 27 assurance activities on a small project that's going to last four weeks because that absolutely is using a sledgehammer to crack a nut so when we talk about proportionality we start understanding what the level of uh, which is kind of comes on to the next bit um is about kind of what's risk based so how much risk is associated with this particular project or program? How much of it, you know, if this project um, is going to blow our business out of the water, if it goes wrong, then obviously we want a much greater level of assurance activities, much more um, focus, much more time and effort, and essentially cost is going to be um associated with delivering that program and I remember um, a long long time ago which gives away my age when I was working on the privatization of the gas industry we had somebody who was uh, the government had sitting with us at uh, 24 7 every day didn't actually kind of contribute to the delivery of the project but was there on every single day of the project for 18 months to make sure that the project was delivering so a huge level of cost associated that but such a huge project with kind of political and financial ramifications uh, that that was um, justified. So risk based becomes kind of really important element when we're thinking about assurance. And then the final one is to ensure that we understand that actually doing assurance should have some response by the organisation. And this is really important, and this is where kind of assurance links into governance. So we talked earlier in the in the agenda about the link between assurance, governance and risk. And this is where it becomes really apparent, because if I go and do an assurance and do a review on a project and I come back and say, well, actually, I don't believe the project is going to deliver on time. I think it's going to go over budget. And even if it does deliver, when it does deliver, is not going to deliver the benefits that we anticipated. What we don't want is for people to go, oh, bugger, that's a bit of a shame. 
Yes, what we really want, and again, that links back to the accountability says, well, actually, what we need to do, somebody needs to put in place some actions to either bring the project back on course or to actually kind of stop the project. So this kind of follow up and escalation. And again, depending on the level of severity of the issues that we find during the view, they may just go back to the project manager and the project team. They may go back to the um the project sponsor, it may be escalated to program, it may be escalated to portfolio, or it may be on a particularly large uh, business critical project, it may actually go back to senior executives in the organisation that sit outside the project structure, because it is so important to that organisation. And if you're working in the public sector, then potentially that may go back up to central government where you're delivering a kind of a government led initiative. So those kind of levels of escalation become really important. And again, the, the, the PMO has an important role to play to ensure all of those principles are established and recognised with the assurance activities that we're going to undertake. Now, one of the um, talking about this kind of overall kind of coordination, we look at um, the different types of risks. So going back to kind of recognising that it's a risk-based approach, um, the underlying element that the PMO would be involved in is actually pulling together what this a kind of assurance map. So recognising what the key risks are associated with any project, understanding where that assurance is being dealt with and making sure that we have the kind of the, so you've got kind of where um, the kind of the primary sources and where perhaps some secondary or some kind of tertiary activities might take place in order to really kind of ensure that all of those elements have been addressed. Now, if you can see in that one is that we've got, uh, we recognize all of our eight sources, but we also recognize that all six risks are being addressed. And this is a kind of a, a we do a, we do an exercise um, where actually we um, have a case study. So we get the case study that's sent out to the delegates as part of their joining instructions. So you can get to read and start applying it to a real project. And actually what you're doing is actually getting some real practice on how to use these principles, how to use some of the tools and techniques that Roy's introduced to us to start drawing up this kind of assurance map from a case study. And often what happens uh, during this part of the course, the, the delegates on the course start thinking about some of the projects and programs, some of the kind of contextual issues around their particular um, organisation. So that although it's not maybe very different to the case study, it starts certainly um, raising people's awareness of things that they need to consider around their particular context, around their particular projects that um, they can get asked specific questions and kind of deal with. So a lot of the exercises are dealt with around this kind of case study, but hopefully in a plan applying those, it brings up um, questions about our own environment. Um, just a couple of other things when we talk about our strategies and plans, we do go into then a level of detail about how our organisations, our individuals' organisations do assurance. So again, starting to look at the elements of an integrated assurance strategy. So as a at an organisation level, typically at kind of portfolio level, in terms of what are we trying to achieve with assurance in our organisation. So what does that look like in terms of the purpose and, purpose and scope? Um, is it going to be for all of the big projects? Is it just going to be for the strategic projects? Or, you know, kind of what level of detail are we going to go down to? Um, how that's going to be applied? where the kind of formal approval process is for the assurance that's going to be undertaken and importantly where those responsibilities and accountabilities are and again a lot of the things that um you know when we think about kind of individual kind of projects and programs they have their own individual elements but a key role of the PMO um, and we co uh, covered off in the PMO competency framework under these enabling competencies is saying well actually as an organization we need to have a kind of a corporate approach in terms of how this is going to be done and then the PMO can then take that and apply it to each project or program that is involved in our organization. So again the reporting and communications which links up to the um, 
escalation routes and overall kind of resourcing. Now, again, keeping a level of objectivity um, ensures that, uh, sorry, may require that we actually have some people who are external to the organisation who come in and actually get involved in some of those assurance activities. So again, depending on our structure of our PMO, whether we've got one office or multiple offices, the level of ob objectivity uh, required for some of that may require external um, reviews. Anybody? use external assurance services who are on the call i'll give an example when i was at uh, when i was at british gas and we were going private we were privatizing the gas industry um sometimes and, and i know um one of the things that's talked with on the course is the use of external resources and actually you know it is a a recognised role to be a P3 or assurance person who kind of comes in and just does reviews on projects and programmes. So Royal talked to you about that as well. So that's the kind of one of the key documents. The other uh, document, again, uh, Roy will kind of talk you through, um, is this integrated assurance plan. So this is about how we tailor it uh, specifically for individual projects and programmes. Now, one of the challenges for going on a course is really understanding about what's required in terms of a tailoring perspective. What we do want to do is for you to kind of come and learn all of this wonderful stuff about integrated assurance, then try and apply it to every project or program. So as we go through the um, the course, uh, we'll continually to ask um, people kind of some of their challenges and Roy will continue to explain how some of the um, elements can be tailored, what are the good bits to leave in, how something can be done in a day, some things can be done in a week to make sure that it's appropriate for your particular uh, project or programme. And should you take uh, the third day option, obviously uh, Roy will spend significant amount of time actually going through it for your individual organisation. One of the good things about coming on a public course is that you get to meet with delegates from all different types of organisations. To act, so actually kind of listening to some of the conversations about uh, the challenges other people have into in their organisations, understanding how they um, how it's going to work for them is really interesting because it broadens your knowledge and takes your knowledge outside of your own particular um, organisation. So really interesting. And again, that's why we ask the delegates to really get involved in the conversations um, and to ask questions. So you don't need to just ask questions about your organisation. You know, if I see kind of Lindsay asking questions about her organisation, I may want to ask some follow on questions because I want to understand um, how I might apply it in those um, situations. We do provide um, on the course um, links to um, a couple of uh, frameworks. So again, these are frameworks that are available that are out there in the um, in the public sector in the public sector in the um, public domain. So you can take them uh, away and actually kind of use some of them and again apply them in your own particular organization. So there are some kind of good uh, standards, some good frameworks that we base those theory on. And what Roy will also talk about for those of you who have um, got um, other certifications, um, Roy will also give you uh, some links and some guidance and some connect all of the dots with where you can find other information around assurance. So for those of you who've done perhaps your uh, Prince2 or MSP certifications, there'll be um, information in there in terms of assurance and reviews. We also have got a number of other kind of APM assurance SIG guys that Roy's contributed to, as well as some kind of wider books and publications that are used for reference. So really kind of quite a, 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 a this is not a kind of a really narrow one book, one particular kind of uh, theory. Roy really has an understanding of all of the best practice that's out there and brings together um, the bits that are kind of most applicable in a um, coordinated and a synergized form that can be taken and used. So you can kind of see Roy as a kind of a walking uh, library of information around the different elements of assurance. So 
I've, I've, I've learned how to speak a bit fast during these taster sessions. So I realized that was kind of a, a whistle stop tour of the assurance. Has anybody got any uh, questions or contributions that they want to make in terms of assurance? Anything that they want to kind of ask, is this specifically covered in the course that they've not spotted so far? Was that too quick? Eileen, oh, just, uh, hi, Garrett. What, what, hi, Garrett. Uh, sorry, so, look, I got two questions. One, very, very trivial. If you go back two slides, you'll be able to answer it. In two slides? Up, yeah, this that one? was it. The integrated TFL, integrated assurance framework. That was what I was trying to figure out what that was. That went by a bit too fast for me. Okay. To okay. But the other question was, I'm, I'm at the moment going through a whole bunch of safe stuff, scaled agile, right? Okay. Uh, and doing a little bunch of background uh, uh, reading. And I'm just wondering, does the course go into how you can have um, how you build your assurance framework in an agile environment now, yes it, yeah he, do, he, he does cover that off um and we had um he's, he's actually kind of just doing a small review and he's going to uh, broaden that out because we recognize that pmos now have uh bimodal is that the phrase where you've actually got kind of the old kind of waterfall and you've got agile delivery so he's looking at kind of how we build that up and and because it's linked up to kind of corporate um, assurance as well so where you've got um, delivery happening in kind of the business as usual offices it kind of integrates that all together so your integrated assurance frameworks covers off uh, the link to corporate agile and waterfall delivery Lovely. And I was on a, a BCS call yesterday, just because, uh, you know, I've got nothing better to do, uh, looking at MOR, the version four is out. And I was I was interested and encouraged to see that uh, where management of risk used to talk about strategic program, project and operational, where it's four levels. It's gone to six now, which I think is great. It looks at strategic portfolio, program, project, product and operational. Yeah? Yes. Uh, and so looking at this and uh, same thing that assurance framework, the corporate bit will look after strategic, right? The assurance framework, you explicitly talked about portfolio, program, project. Yes. Uh, operational assurance probably falls outside of the realm of what we expect the PMO to get into. Yes. And, I'm just wondering, and therefore, I'm just wondering about product and whether that's caught, caught up in agile because of the product base of agile as well, or whether there's a, a, a thing because I kind of feel in my gut there should be a thing the PMO can do around product assurance where you have a sort of like a no project, product-based life cycle going on in an organization. Um, I don't think that he covers particularly product, but I will certainly ask uh, Roy the question and I shall make sure that he's keyed up to answer questions around product before he next runs the course. Yeah, it's just quite interesting that, that MOR has gone that way. And so I could imagine the whole um, um, best, best, uh, best, best practice. Matching, best practice. It's whether it all kind of catches up those. with them. So exactly. let me just, um, I will check with Roy before he delivers the course. So he'll be able to, he'll be able to answer that. Yeah. I've got no Great. doubt it's Thank well you. within his remit. Yeah, it's, it's all applied common sense, right? It's just... Somebody's well, as, as is all as is all project management, but having it kind of structured so you can, um, um, what's the word, take it all in is really kind of helpful. Any other questions? No. So the next um, assurance course, uh, Roy will be delivering on the 15th and 16th of March. So there's still plenty of time um, to sign up um, for that. Um, if you've um, interested in some of our other courses, these are our up and coming public courses. So we've got essentials for managers and for analysts coming up. We've also got a P3O foundation. And talking about Agile, we've got our, our very popular Lean Agile PMO course also running um, on the 8th and 9th of March. Um, for those of you who come from larger organisations and perhaps have got a, a bunch of you who are interested um, in attending a course, we do run all of our courses in-house and typically if you've got a six delegates or more, much as I've talked about the benefits of coming on a public course, there are some benefits of doing a, a, an internal course because we can kind of have conversations specific to your organisation as a, in terms of some of the group work. Um, but if you've got six or more people, Charles is also so on the call, uh, Charles Shaw, who's our sales lead, and he'll be uh, very happy to kind of talk to you about coming to run uh, an in-house course. Um, 
for all of our courses, again, we um, help um, embedding support. So again, we can do follow-up days. Uh, Roy's is very kind of uh, structured in terms of come and help your team um, embed that. But we also offer a whole range of one-to-one -one coaching. So if you as an individual want support, uh, putting it in your organization, do get in touch and we will help you. So... Um... <laughs>